At 4.30 in the afternoon on the 10th of October, 1957, a fire was discovered in the core of Reactor 1 at Windscale. It was Britain's worst nuclear disaster. I've heard of Dante's Inferno. Well, it couldn't have been any worse than what I saw there. Well, you couldn't stare at it. You just had to turn away. It made one numb, really. It was so horrifying that one, ju one just went numb. Then there was so much to do that one didn't have time to get really agitated about it. I don't think any of us thought of ourselves as heroes. Um, my personal attitude was that there was a job to be done and we just had to get on with it, and it was a national emergency that had to be dealt with. Thirty-two years after the fire, the damaged windscale reactor at Sellafield is still radioactive. The windscale fire consumed eight tons of uranium. It took 140 men 30 hours and over 2 million gallons of water to cool the burning core. Until Chernobyl, it was the world's worst reactor accident. But the fire, terrible as it was, had one hidden benefit. It closed the two early windscale reactors forever. Tonight, we will show for the first time on television what really went on inside the reactors that they were inherently unsafe, that they severely and secretly contaminated the surrounding countryside long before the fire, and that this contamination was deliberately hidden from the public. This is the story of the first windscale reactors and the fire which closed them. It is told by the men and women who worked at the site in the 1950s, dedicated patriotic scientists and engineers who were intent on bringing Britain into the atomic age. Windscale is unique. It is science fiction intruding on our sober lives. And it is a very great producer of plutonium, the pure atomic fuel for both industrial and weapons projects. The two windscale reactors were built in West Cumbria shortly after the Second World War. Each pile, as the buildings were called, produced plutonium, the explosive material in atomic bombs, for Britain's nuclear weapons program. It was uh, an immense uh, construction, and I well remember going inside it for the first time. Uh, everybody had to change into uh, clothes with uh, vests and socks and white overalls, headgear. And uh, when you got inside the pile, it was uh, like a science fiction set. All these people in white climbing up ladders and uh, you could walk all over the pile, of course. And uh, it just seemed an immense structure and I was absolutely amazed at the enormity of it. Well, there was a tremendous sort of feeling of adventure and I think a feeling that we had to have an atom bomb to remain uh, amongst the great powers. I think if you remember, Ernest Bevan in the Labour government, who was Foreign Secretary, said that without it he felt he would be going naked into the conference chamber. And this prevailed and therefore a great amount of energy uh, went into trying to meet the time scale, which was a very tight one, starting in 46 and exploding a first weapon in October 1952. And this in fact was accomplished. In October 1952, using the plutonium made in Windscale, Britain became a nuclear power. This colour film of the bomb has only now been declassified. Windscale's work didn't stop with the first nuclear explosion. More plutonium was urgently needed for Britain's nuclear stockpile. Unlike other reactors, the Windscale piles which produced the material for the British bomb were air-cooled. Air, sucked in through ducts, was pumped by giant fans over the uranium fuel held in the graphite core. 
At great speed, the cooling air passed over the uranium and rushed up the chimneys, through filters at the top. These filters were meant to prevent radioactive particles escaping into the environment. Not a watt of electricity was generated. The sole purpose of the reactors was to make plutonium for nuclear weapons. The reactor was powered by uranium fuel placed inside aluminium cans. Over 70,000 of these cartridges were slid sideways into the reactor core. The reactor was covered by a concrete and steel biological shield. Hundreds of steel and lead plugs sealed the fuel channels in which the uranium cartridges were placed. Four fuel channels were placed behind every plug. Each channel took 21 cartridges. When the fuel was spent, the cartridges containing the now highly radioactive uranium were pushed out of the back of the core and removed for plutonium extraction. The wind-scale piles were Britain's first large-scale nuclear reactors. Although their design was simple, they had several limitations. The strange shape of the reactor chimneys was the result of the last-minute addition of filters. At first, they had been thought unnecessary. The filters had to be placed in boxes on the top of the stacks as an afterthought. They were as good as they could have been uh, designed with the information and against the timescales that they were produced. But of course, under those conditions, they had certain limitations. And the problem with wind scale was, in fact, not recognizing those limitations and therefore taking the appropriate management steps to see that, uh, that they didn't do anything stupid. In 1955, work was well underway at Calder, next door to the wind scale piles on two more reactors. During the development of Calder, a rumor spread about the site that levels of radioactivity in the area were rising. The huge cooling towers at the Calder plant, together with the wind scale chimneys, dominate the Cumbrian countryside. Radioactivity escaping from the plant could contaminate the local village of Seascale. In 1955, a scientist at Calder decided to check the contamination rumors. I took home a gag counter that the electronics department in the research and development department had just, just recently made. And uh, I ran it over the lawn and I was amazed to discover that uh, the places where the activity was quite enormous. And uh, one of these uh, spots I dug up, I took it in the kitchen, put it on the bench, cut it, uh, cut it in half and then discovered which half had the activity in it and continued in this way till I eventually came down to a single particle which uh, looked to me like uranium oxide. Dr. Leslie has kept the particle. It is still radioactive. 35 years ago, it was much more radioactive. Well, I was rather amazed and uh, rather taken aback. I didn't regard it with any a sort of fear that, uh, with hindsight, obviously I should have thought of it as being rather hazardous. But I think without a doubt, um, all the people in Seascale and the factory will have either inhaled or ingested one of these particles. The particle was irradiated uranium oxide. It contained a cocktail of radioactive materials, including cesium, strontium-90, and plutonium. Dr. Leslie decided to share his discovery with a colleague who lived down the road in Seascale. He took his Geiger counter with him. Dr. Jackman didn't live far away, and uh, I thought it would be interesting to see whether his garden was much the same, and uh, so I went over to see him. So I said, what's all this about? And he said that he'd uh, just been monitoring his own garden and found some high spots of activity. So I sort of said, well, you know, let's go out. And so we went into our garden. Uh, sure enough, uh, every uh, few yards, uh, there, there was a high reading. The meter uh, reading went up to the top and 
uh, this was quite alarming and we came back into the house, quite a few spots in the house and even in our larder. After the discovery of radioactive particles at his home, Dr. Jakeman began to wonder how extensive the contamination was. At that time, the Atomic Energy Authority was conducting routine surveys of radioactivity. Derek Jakeman decided to follow up the Authority's work with his own monitoring. Well, I took one of the, the sites, the Geiger counters, and uh, measured what was on the pasty land. And uh, yes, that was quite astonishing, because uh, every few yards, there were very high increases. The uh, microphone on the guy counter really just sort of uh, hummed. So these were very uh, uh, highly active individual particles, and there were a lot of them. Uh, later, I estimated that... Uh, a very rough estimate, that, that there would be really sort of um, tens or hundreds of millions of particles surrounding the site. Using their rather Heath Robinson samplers, the Atomic Energy Authority confirmed Jakeman and Leslie's discovery of particles. They found that the severe particle contamination had lasted for a year at least. But the Medical Research Council, when consulted, concluded that the levels were not a hazard. Jakeman and Leslie were told to hand back their Geiger counters and mind their own business. The authorities' chairman decided to keep the contamination secret. We were trained to handle radioactive materials so that we didn't spread it about, we didn't breathe it in, and you didn't uh, get contaminated with it. Therefore, it had never occurred to me that somebody was spraying it outside in over the countryside. It was soon discovered where the particles were coming from. Normally, when fuel cartridges in the core were spent, they were pushed out of the reactor into skips in a water duct at the back. Still underwater, the cartridges were taken to the cooling pond between the reactors to await plutonium extraction. The water was meant to prevent the escape of any highly radioactive particles. However, because of a fault in the reactor, not all the cartridges were falling into the water. As the cartridges were pushed out of the core, some fell into the massive air ducts at the back. There they sat, often damaged for months. Highly radioactive particles from the cartridges were swept up the chimney. Part of the problem can still be seen inside the damaged reactor. This film was taken by remote camera long after the fire. No worker is allowed behind the core today. The film shows dislodged and damaged cartridges. One is caught behind a steel frame. When trapped in this position before the fire, its contents, radioactive uranium dust, would have leaked out of the damaged cartridge. The radioactive dust would then join the cooling airstream and be blown up the chimney. The radioactive particles which reached the top of the chimneys should have been stopped by the filters. The filters had been placed in galleries at the top of the stacks at the last moment. They were made up of rows of about 800 corrugated fiberglass panels. The panels were pushed into position in the chimneys through V-shaped slots in the side galleries. We now know that the filters never worked properly. You have to remember that these filters were having a particularly hard life there because the volume of air passing through the filter was a ton a second and the air movement was something around 50, 55 miles an hour and a ton of air a second going at that speed is uh, not the best of things to try and filter. So technically it was a very difficult problem. The filters clogged very easily, and this meant that uh, they had to take them out and wash them and put them back uh, on an 11-day cycle. And with this constant washing, they got uh, damaged. In addition to that, the material was very easily torn. Uh, there were really gaping holes in the filters. <laughs> 
Uh, and so the efficiency was very much lower than the specified efficiency of 99.9%. And what does that mean? Well, that meant that uh, if any um, radioactive particles were released in the reactor, then there was nothing to stop them from going straight up the chimney, through the filters and out of the countryside. In public, the authorities' spokesman denied that contamination was taking place. Mr. Hugh Howells told the local newspaper that the amount of radioactive dust reaching the ground is so negligible that it cannot be measured. While this doesn't sort of fit in with open government, that everybody should know everything, um, at that time it was thought that the peace of mind of the people concerned was more important than passing information out, because undoubtedly it would be misinterpreted. Well, that, that was obviously done in order to counter any rumour that uh, we might have let out that there were particles coming out. It was just a deliberate policy because there must have been quite a few people that were aware of these particles. Looking rather like a super version of a plastic Macintosh is a new suit designed for workers at Britain's atomic plants. Despite the light-hearted newsreel, the reality was that the new suits were made to protect men going inside the windscale reactors to remove the leaking cartridges. Once you're inside and the zip's been fastened, all that remains is to pump in compressed air so that the wearer can breathe easily. One had to dress up rather like a diver, but in lighter gear, full PVC suit with a, an air hood and a, an air hose which went outside to supply one with, uh, with fresh air. And uh, one's time in that location was very strictly limited because uh, of the radiation levels. The removal of leaking cartridges inside the reactors was a desperate measure to stop the contamination at its source. Quite a few, quite a lot of cartridges, in fact, uh, landed in the, in the air ducts, and these had to be shoveled out, and that was quite a major operation, because we had to put in relays of people uh, to... Um, to get rid of these cartridges into the water duct. But the problem persisted. Between 1955 and 1957, the contamination continued, despite all attempts to stop it. In the summer of 1957, a secret government delegation arrived from London to examine the situation. They were briefed by the health, physics and safety manager. We were informed by Mr. Howells that the emission of active particles in the cooling air from the pile stacks which was first discovered in 1955 does in fact continue steadily. This occurs in spite of attempts to improve the efficiency of stack filters. But before anything further could be done, events took their own course. The windscale reactors had another major problem, a problem which was to lead to the fire and to their closure. Because the piles were air-cooled and operated at low temperatures, an accident was just waiting to happen. As the nuclear reaction took place, energy slowly built up in the reactor's graphite core. If this stored energy was left in the heart of the pile, it became dangerous. It could escape spontaneously in a powerful rush of intense heat. In 1948, Edward Teller, the American atom scientist, warned the British that an unplanned release of energy could cause a major disaster. His warnings were dismissed. Rather than close down the reactors and stop the production of plutonium, the scientists at Windscale improvised their own solution. The stored energy would be forced out by turning off the cooling fans and deliberately overheating the reactor. As the graphite core became hot, the stored energy would release itself. But as time passed, it became increasingly difficult to release this energy, known to scientists as Wigner energy. It was needing a higher and higher temperature to, to actually get the release to start. Uh, in addition, there were pockets of uh, Wigner energy uh, which had not been released uh, on previous occasions. So you had these two problems side by side. <laughs> 
The secret records show how difficult the releases of stored energy were becoming. By 1957, Reactor 1 was allowed to heat up to 400 degrees centigrade to get rid of the stored energy. The reactor operators had been walking a tightrope. They were doing it that way because they'd got away with it. But I don't think they realised they'd been lucky. Uh, they'd perhaps done it more cautiously in the earlier days. And they'd slowly got, quite frankly, uh, not realising the, 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 the dangers that you're using extremely powerful machines. And you've therefore, you can't afford to drive them blind. On Monday, the 7th of October, 1957, Reactor 1 at Windscale was shut down and cooling stopped in preparation for a release of stored energy. There were no operating manuals. Each release was largely a matter of judgment. A second nuclear heating was applied on Tuesday. Temperatures inside the reactor began to rise. Early on Thursday morning, it was realized that something unusual was happening. I found that the level of activity was about 10 times what it normally was. And um, I thought there was something seriously wrong. So I went along to see um, Tom Hughes, who was the works manager at that time, and said to him that uh, I was a bit concerned insofar that we'd had an unusual air sample. And uh, did he have any idea whether there was anything wrong or not? I had no real ideas except that I knew for certain that this was not emanating from the chemical plant and therefore it may well be the reactors. So we decided to go up and have a look-see on the reactor itself. And when we got up there, we went immediately to the power control room and I noticed that the stack activity meter, which measures the radioactivity on the filter at the top of the stack, was at full-scale reading. So I turned to Tom Hughes and said, you realize if that's full-scale, this means a site emergency. We decided we ought to look at the uh, reactor core, and uh, a team was assembled to go up onto the charge face and uh, take out uh, one or two of the plugs and see if they could visually see what uh, was happening inside. We went onto the charge face, suitably attired in PVC clothing, and an inspection plug was taken out. And to our complete horror, we could see four channels of fuel, a bright cherry red. On Thursday afternoon, Attempts were made to bludgeon out the burning fuel cartridges with scaffolding poles. But the cartridges were stuck fast and could not be dislodged. The poles themselves became red hot and the area in contact with the fuel became yellow from the uranium oxide that was produced due to the burning of the uranium. And that was highly radioactive? That was very radioactive, yes. By Thursday evening, the fire had taken hold inside the center of the core. Tom Tui was summoned to the stricken reactor. I got a phone call saying, pile one is on fire. And I said, good God, you don't mean the core? He said, yes, can you come in? I said, yes. When I first went up to the top of the reactor, and this was carrying 35 pounds breathing apparatus on my back and in full protective clothing, and a low 80 feet up in the air doesn't really sound very high. Uh, by the time I had got to the top, my chin was awash in my own sweat inside the respirator. The first thought was to blow the uh, flames out by putting on the full blowers and uh, increasing the cooling. Uh, in retrospect, that was not a very good idea, and we soon learnt that uh, this was uh, making matters worse rather than better. The uranium fuel at the heart of the core was now burning furiously. But as the fire progressed, the glow became greater. Then small flames began to shoot out from the affected channels. Eventually a roaring inferno was shooting out from the back of the reactor and hitting the 
back concrete wall. During the night, we did try and extinguish the fire with carbon dioxide. It so happened that uh, that very day, a tanker with 20 tons of liquid carbon dioxide had come in to Calder Hall. So we got this rigged up, and I had plugs pulled out of the charge face of the reactor and literally stood there holding this lance and watching to see whether the carbon dioxide had any effect. And there was this poor, poor little tube with carbon dioxide being poked into it. I had absolutely no hope that it was going to work. On Friday morning, workers on the site were told of the fire. They were ordered to remain indoors and wear face masks. The chief constable was warned of a possible emergency. Only a mile away at sea scale, no public warnings were issued. Although evacuation plans were in hand, they were considered unnecessary. But many in the village realized that something was plainly wrong. There was smoke coming out of the, uh, out of the chimney, which was the first time I'd ever seen smoke coming out of the chimney. <laughs> and that put the fear of God into me. At the time I was working at Calder, which is the power station on the other side of the river, and the works manager rang me up and uh, said there's a site emergency, they're having trouble at wind scale, and that um, it would be prudent to stay indoors and close the windows and so forth. That was at four o'clock, I remember quite clearly, on the Thursday. And yet, on the other side of the fence, absolutely nothing was done. And there it was, uh, from my own measurements, the fallout at Calder was just the same as the fallout at sea scale. And the reason for that is that, of course, on a chimney, the maximum fallout tends to be some way downwind, not immediately adjacent to the chimney. So that members of the public were walking around unaware of the fire? Oh, yes, absolutely. While workers were staying indoors? Yes. Some of my friends had cycled from sea scale along the edge of the sea and uh, we discovered to our horror that their hair, they, we monitored the front of their hair, it, um, it went off the scale of the instrument completely. Now at that time I don't think we'd ever come across that amount of activity. The, the, the instruments had never been stretched to that limit as it were and we were quite horrified. I took a tissue and uh, rubbed it over my son's shoes and uh, I was amazed to find that off, on my son's feet the count rate, I can remember this, there was 3,500 counts a minute and uh, in the laboratory if you had a count rate of more than 600 counts per minute you were regarded as being contaminated and there we were, six times the normal level in sea scale. Early on Friday morning, the decision was taken to put out the fire with water, despite the possibility of an explosion. Our job was to take the what they call saline plugs. We had to remove some of these to put horse pipes down. When you looked down the channel, it was just white hot. Really speaking, nobody would, under, would believe how hot it could possibly be. Now, I've never seen anything like it, and I don't suppose anybody else will ever will. By this time, it was a, you know, a blazing inferno. I mean, I did stand to one side for part of the time, you know, hopefully, but inevitably, if you're looking straight into the core of a shutdown reactor, you're going to get quite a lot of radiation. And I discovered that I was contaminated on my hands, my hair, up me nose and so then we down to the surgery and back again still couldn't get it clear and it took three weeks actually to get the whole lot cleared before the day shift began on friday the 11th of october water was ready to flow through the fire hoses attached high on the charge face and into the core <laughs> 
At the same time, all cooling air coming into the pile was shut off. Then the whole pile was cleared of personnel. And uh, I remember Tom and I uh, went down to the depth and sat like a couple of miners down <laughs> and ready to give the instruction to uh, get the, uh, turn the water on. I asked for water at 40 pounds pressure and I listened. No noise, so then I asked for 60, then 80, then 120, which was full pressure. No noise. The worry, of course, was if the water produced hydrogen, the whole lot could have gone, gone up. <laughs> and, uh, it, at that moment, it wasn't a very pleasant situation. When I went back up to the reactor, the holes that I was looking down at the back had steel plates on them. They didn't have the plugs in them. And there was a hole in these plates and you could lift off the plate with a hook, a metal hook. I tried to pull up the plate on one of these holes and no matter how hard I pulled, I couldn't move it. And this was the fire trying to suck air in from wherever it could. I have no doubt it was even sucking air in down through the chimney at this stage to try and maintain itself. Well, eventually, I got this plate off so that I could look down at the back of the reactor once more. And I could almost see the fire dying away. It was really dramatic. First of all, the flames went and the flames reduced and then the, the glow began to die down. And I inspected it oh, a number of times uh, up until about midday when I couldn't see any sign of any fire, any glow, anything. And I was satisfied that the fire was out. The Atomic Energy Authority's first admission that there was a fire was broadcast on the BBC's Friday lunchtime bulletin. The Atomic Energy Authority have announced that some uranium cartridges in the centre of the atomic pilot wind scale became overheated yesterday. The Authority have said that staff are now reducing the temperature of the pile with water. At the moment, a northeast wind is blowing across the wind scale factory and is taking any radioactive dust or vapour out to sea. It was obvious that it hadn't blown out to sea, that quite a lot of it was in the coastal strip. It was highly unsatisfactory that the uh, authority should be able to hu hush these things up when there was obviously something radically wrong. So I wrote to The Guardian, and the, the letter appeared on the, the Tuesday. In his letter, Frank Leslie complained that no warning had been given to members of the public during the fire and that no proper measures had been taken to protect them. He called for better emergency planning in future. I said I had made measurements which were almost identical with those that Frank Leslie had made and that, in my opinion, they did not constitute the hazard and certainly uh, there would be no point in uh, frightening the people in the neighbourhood unnecessarily. Dr. Leslie's letter attracted a great deal of attention in the press, but no action was taken against him. They also were aware that I was uh, discovered the 1955 discharges, which uh, had been concealed. And it was obvious if they took action that I would then reveal that they'd been hushing things up previously. Harold Macmillan, the Prime Minister, was infuriated by Leslie's public criticisms. He demanded an immediate explanation. The briefing he received made no mention of Dr. Leslie's earlier discovery of contamination around the windscale plant, contamination which had been deliberately covered up. The Prime Minister wrote that Leslie must be an opinionated ass. Macmillan was unaware of the reactor's troubled past. The Prime Minister went as far as calling you an opinionated ass. Well, I think the reason for that was that he probably was quite unaware that there had been discharges previously and that um, nothing had been done about it. Emergency at Windscale Adam Blood. 
and the milk from 200 square miles of farmland is condemned as radioactive. Now the worst seems to be over, though Mr. Stan Ritson, who helped to bring Windscale's overheated reactor under control, was radioactive for four days and couldn't even kiss his wife till the Geiger counters gave permission. The idea was wearing a rubber gloves at home. It would sweat the contamination out, you see. So I went into the pub, and the barman who was there at the time, what's uh, the gloves on for, Stan? I said, oh, a bit of contamination, that's all. And by that time, all the reporters were up there, you see, newspaper reporters. So we went and spread it around the hotel. And next thing, they were in there, chocolate blocker. Oh, what's the trouble? What's the trouble? Oh, I've never so fed up in all my life. The headlines, the most radioactive man in Britain. Atomic Stan, a man who can't kiss his wife goodnight. And so it's rubbish as all that. To me, it was rubbish. From what I know, it never done me any harm, put it that way. I haven't felt no ill effects from it. The plume of radioactivity from the fire travelled across England and over the North Sea to Holland. Dr. Johannes Bloch, an alert Dutch scientist, was waiting for it. In 1957, when he checked air filter papers, he found an unusual trace of radioactivity. At once, Dr. Bloch contacted the Atomic Energy Authority in England. He was asked to fly to Britain with his filter papers immediately. Every time, I wanted to know what exactly was on the filter. They couldn't tell me and they changed over to another subject or something like that. So after two days, at the evening uh, in my hotel, I decided to, to get angry anyway next day if I didn't get more information. But when I came up in the laboratory, they told me it was polonium. Polonium is a volatile and highly radioactive material. The authority was determined that its escape should remain a secret. Well, it was an essential component of the weapons of that time, and clearly the government and the military authorities didn't want to make available details of how to make a, a nuclear weapon, um, or how they were doing it themselves, partly because of the obvious security point, and partly because the country was negotiating with the United States at that stage to get as much sharing of information as possible, and I don't think they wanted to let the United States know in advance just how much or how little we knew. The contamination of local milk with other radioactivity was a hazard, however, which the authority could not ignore. Milk marketing board lorries collect the contaminated milk. The trouble arose when radioactive dust from the overheated pile fell on the Cumberland pastures and milk samples rushed to Harwell were found to contain six times as much radioactive iodine as international health standards permit. So for the time being, down the drain it goes. Meanwhile, emergency supplies from outside are delivered to more than 5,000 people who normally get their milk from the banned farms. We were able to apply a milk ban quite early on so that the radiation exposure in particular to children, which is what we were concerned about, uh, was limited by the fact that we quite quickly got this ban into operation. As the milk was checked, an embarrassing discovery was made. Local milk was indeed contaminated, but much of the contamination came not from the fire, but from the leaks before the fire. Worst of all, was the discovery of high levels of radioactive strontium in the milk and on local pastures. We found more strontium in some samples, particularly grass samples, than we had expected. And so there was, at that stage, uh, an urgent need to make sure that there had not been a greater escape of strontium than we had suspected. Now, where had this strontium come from? In fact, it had come from the, the particles of uranium oxide prior to the accident, which had escaped through the filters. Why hadn't it been discovered before? Well, it had been discovered. Its scale had not been recognised. The scale of distribution had not been recognised. A secret meeting of experts was called by the Medical Research Council to advise on the discovery. The scientists were concerned by what they learned. <laughs> 
that the windscale reactors had been leaking radioactivity persistently for some time before the fire. The risks could no longer be discounted. It is now evident that relatively high average concentrations of strontium-90 have characterized milk from this region over considerable periods of time. Although it is practically certain that these concentrations, even if continued, could not produce any detectable increase in bone cancer and leukemia in a population of the size at risk, it would be impossible to deny that such levels might be a factor in the causation of any particular case in this district. It was really quite a shock. I'd never heard of leukemia. Um, a friend of mine, their second child, died of leukemia in C scale. He was three years old, and that was a shock to me. I, because I didn't connect it with the works at the time. But then um, another child had leukemia, and this other lady that uh, had gone off during the fire, she died of leukemia. And I think there was another case, and really, it was so startling that there are all these people with leukemia that we began to think about the plant. Advice was received at 1 p.m. on the 2nd of November 1957 that samples of grass and milk from West Cumberland would be made available for urgent analysis. A crash program of sampling began in secret to check the extent of contamination from releases before the fire. Although it has never been admitted publicly, officials kept the milk ban in place, not only because of the effects of the fire, but also because of the previous leaks. In the years before the fire, levels of radioactivity in milk and grass may have been much higher. But until the accident, levels had never been properly checked. Derek Jakeman has studied the leaks which took place before the fire. The government now accepts his estimate that at least 20 kilos of enriched uranium leaked from the chimneys. It's maybe the first example of a, a deliberate decision to deceive the public. I pointed out that I considered it to be the worst example of exposure to the public uh, from the nuclear power programme. I also pointed out that the estimated levels of uh, risk from the incident was between uh, 30 and 100 times the estimated risk for the fire. In October 1957, government officials realised they could no longer hide the leaks. Some facts would have to be admitted, but no figures were to be given and no dates mentioned. The Medical Research Council's report into the fire did the job. Hidden away in a dense paragraph was the admission that contamination had taken place prior to the fire. It was added the leaks could be of no significance to health. Nobody in the press picked it up. Well, I think undoubtedly some people will be affected, but one has to remember that a large proportion of people die of cancer anyway, and from the authorities' point of view, and taking a cynical view, the few extra that do die due to these discharges will hardly, hardly show up at all in the statistics. Harold Macmillan and his ministers never learned the full extent of the secret contamination which took place before the fire. In briefings, he and his colleagues were only informed of a single incident in the spring of 1957. Macmillan banned the full report on the fire. A censored version appeared instead, which blamed the disaster on inadequate equipment and faulty judgment. The two reactors at Windscale were shut down. It was realized that they were probably too expensive and unsafe to operate. Scientists warned that milk production in the Windscale area might have to stop if the remaining undamaged reactor started again and the leaks continued. The Windscale fire in 1957 stopped the secret, persistent and serious contamination of the local population with radioactivity. In this sense, it was a blessing in disguise.
Derek Jakeman has estimated that local babies born in the mid-1950s would have received high radiation doses, much higher than those recommended today for workers at the plant itself. For four years, the reactors had released their long-lasting poisons. It contaminated the whole of West Cumbria, which is a terrible high price to pay. There are specks of the dust that came out of those chimneys still in the sediments of lakes to this day and will be there forever. Work has begun on the slow process of taking down the two wind scale chimneys at Sellafield and dismantling the reactors. Government scientists now say that 100 people may die over the years as a result of the radioactivity, chiefly polonium, which escaped during the fire. In February this year, workers at the site were shocked by a scientific study which linked radiation doses to men at the plant with leukemia in local children. But work expanding Sellafield continues. It is now one of the world's largest nuclear reprocessing centers. There was no doubt that using the knowledge that uh, we have today, those plants should not have operated at all. Uh, that there were various features about them which were really in, inherently unsafe, but uh, the needs for the materials that we were producing were paramount at that time. The military needs? The military needs, yes. They were built, and of course old Lord Hinton was the first to say they were built as monuments to our ignorance. But they carried out the job which they were intended to do. Um, the reactors were made to produce military-grade plutonium, and for us, I suppose, looking back to kid ourselves that uh, having nuclear weapons, we could remain a great power. They served their purpose. Their purpose was achieved at a high price. The atmosphere which surrounded the work of the reactors has cost much public trust. Concern remains that there may have been other nuclear incidents which have been covered up and of which we still know nothing. The terrible legacy of the windscale reactors will be with the nuclear industry for many years to come. <laughs>